All right, John chapter 11. Now, pretty much if you notice, this entire chapter is, is dedicated to this story of Lazarus and Lazarus being raised from the dead. And um, you know, I, I told Sebastian before the before service started that um, it's probably not going to be that long of a sermon. But, you know, every time I say that, it, it always tends to go a little bit longer. So I, I want to watch my words because I tend to just keep going and going sometimes. But, uh, anyways, chapter 11. Let's look down at verse number 1. We have, this, we have this great story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Verse number 1 says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord of ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we get a little bit of information here about Lazarus and Martha and Mary. Uh, Martha and Mary, of course, were sisters, but this is their brother, Lazarus. And um, this is a family. These are people that, G that were friends with Jesus. They, they loved Jesus, and Jesus loved them. We see it later in this chapter. Um, and this story isn't even in the book of John. John's referring to this story about Mary when she was weeping, and she was wiping, literally just, just wiping his feet off with the hairs of her head. She was crying and with her tears and with her hair, she was cleaning his feet. Just, just really humble, really meek, just, just at Jesus Christ's feet. And that's in Luke chapter 7. If you don't remember that story, you go and look at that later. Um, he was sitting and speaking with a Pharisee, and the Pharisee was looking at her and saying, and, and thinking in his head, he's thinking, you know, if this guy were a prophet, he would know what type of woman this was that was touching him, that she's a sinner. And this is that type of attitude that he had, you know, this puffed up attitude where they would look down on people as sinners and just be like, you know, you can't even let someone touch you. And Jesus explains, he gives them a parable of a, of a debtor and, and people who, you know, someone who owed a lot of money and someone who owed a little. And he says, you know, the person, he says, who do you think is going to be more gracious if the, if the guy forgives both of them? You know, both of their debts are forgiven. Well, this guy owes a million dollars, this guy owes five dollars, right? Well, the guy who owed a million dollars, that gets forgiven. He's really going to appreciate that and love the fact that, that, that he forgave that debt a lot more than the guy who just owed five bucks. And that's what he was saying. He said, see, her, she, her sins are many. Yeah, she was a sinner. She had a lot of sins. But she's forgiven, and she loves much. She loved Jesus much. Because she was forgiven. Because, yes, yeah, she had all these sins, but she was forgiven of those sins. Um, this is that same Mary that we're talking about here. And Mary had a sister, Martha. And we see other stories in the Bible that regard these people. But um, Lazarus is their brother. So we see in the story, Lazarus gets sick. He falls ill. And, and it's a serious sickness because he, he ends up dying from it. And then it says in verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold... He whom thou lovest is sick. So they send unto Jesus because, because he's sick, and they know that Jesus can do something about it. Jesus has been, been performing miracles, you know, in his ministry. He's been going around. He's been healing people. People have been blind. He's been healing the sick, the lepers, the lame, all these different people. So they know Jesus has the power to heal their brother. And they even say, you know, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now, what a great thing to be said. Think, imagine if that were you. If someone could go to Jesus and, and describe you as someone that Jesus loves. Now, that's great. And, and, and to be in that type of a, have like a relationship with him and just to be comfortable and to know, hey, Jesus really loves me. That's a, that's a great feeling to have, to, to know that the Son of God loves you individually, which he did. He loved Mary, he loved Martha, and he loved Lazarus. He loved these people. They were his friends. They meant something to him. And, you know, if you're saved, if you're born again, if you're a child of God, you mean something to Jesus, too. We all do. Everyone, everyone who's saved, you, you mean something to him. And don't forget that. It's easy to repeat, you know, that, that Jesus loves you. And we say that often, or you hear that often. But think about that. I mean, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, he does love you. And, and that's, that's powerful. It's important. You have, like that great, you have that great relationship with him, knowing that he loves you. So they send to Jesus and they say, you know, he whom thou lovest is sick. Because they want him to come. Verse number four, it says, then Jesus heard that. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. 
He knows the whole purpose for this. And that's why he's saying, even though Lazarus dies, he says, this isn't unto death. The sickness isn't, the purpose of the sickness isn't so, isn't so that he dies. It's to bring glory unto God. He knew that Lazarus was going to die. He knows all of this. He, this is part of the plan. But he even says, this isn't for, for unto death. Because he didn't remain dead. Jesus rose him from the dead. Um, and that's why he says, this is just for the glory of God. So what he does is he waits. Now Jesus, it says in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Jesus loved that family. He hears word from them. He hears, they, you know, they're worried. They're sick. They, you know, all they do is, you imagine, you know, he's sick. You, they're probably guessing he's going to die. They're like, well, let's call for Jesus. You know, Jesus, our friend, Jesus can heal him. Let's call for Jesus Christ. Let's, let's get him over here. Hey, he whom thou lovest is sick. Come, you know, come, heal him. And it says in verse 6, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So he does something, he has a reaction that, that no one probably quite understands. At least not at this time. He, is, he hears about it, and he just waits. So he just, he, instead of hurrying up and, and rushing to go and see him and see what he could do for him, he hangs back. So he's, he's still there, he says, okay. And it's because he already knows. He's got the plan, he knows the plan in his head. But he waits there two days, and that says in verse 7, Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Albeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. So Jesus is telling him, he's like, okay, look, Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going to go and I'm going to go wake him up. And they think, well, normally when you're sick, anyone, when you're ill, when you're sick, it's always good to just get a lot of rest, right? If you, you get the flu, you get some other kind of sickness, normally it wipes you out, your body's achy, you're sore, you're tired. Typically what you do, you drink a lot of fluids and you lay in bed and you just get some rest and that rest will help your body. Um, and I know this from experience, you know, if you have to go out and work, sometimes men, you get sick, but you still have to go out and work. You have to, you know, you, you financially, you just can't afford to stay in bed or whatever. You have to go out and work. Well, if you have to go out and do that, and you're pushing yourself and you go out working, it's going to prolong your sickness. You're going to be sick a lot longer because you're not giving your body what it needs in that rest. And that's basically what they're saying here. They're like, look, if he sleeps, you know, he'll, he'll do okay. You know, just let him get his rest. We don't got to go wake him up. But, of course, Jesus wasn't talking about, about that rest. He's, he had to spell it out for him. It says in verse 14, Then said Jesus unto them, Plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he says he's asleep. He meant that he was, he was, he was dead, physically dead. Um, now, there's a doctrine out there today. It's called soul sleep. And this is one of the places where they'll, where they'll come up with this doctrine. And oftentimes in the Bible, you'll see when people die, they're referred to as, sometimes they're referred to as being asleep. Um, the Bible talks about those that are asleep in Christ. Um, and what that's doing, it's, it's referring to people who are dead. But if you think about it, it's a, it's a pretty accurate term in this sense. If you have eternal life, you're never truly dead. So Lazarus, even here, wasn't truly dead. So Jesus said that he was asleep. But just so that you can understand that, it's not false to say he's dead because physically his body died. But Lazarus was still alive. Lazarus had eternal life. Lazarus was saved. But his body, yes, his body had died. So when the Bible refers to people being asleep, it's just a way of stating, you know, when they have eternal life, you're not really dead. You're still alive. Your body is just like asleep in the grave. But what some people will teach is that, oh no, this soul sleep means that when your body is buried, that your soul is also just remains in your body, and that your soul is just like, it's like you're asleep. And that's false, and, and I could prove that to you from the Bible, why it's false. We'll just look at a couple places real quick. Um, for one, we don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be right back in John 11. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but... Um, 
If you remember in Luke 16, I just went over this on my, on my sermon on hell. We had the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And that Lazarus is a different Lazarus, not the Lazarus that, that's in this story. So that Lazarus was a poor beggar who, um, you know, he was begging at the rich man's house just for the crumbs of his table. They both died, the, the, the rich man and Lazarus. And in that story, the Bible says that Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So his soul was not asleep anywhere. He still was existing, and, and he was carried on into heaven to be with Abraham, whereas the rich man then who went to hell, it says, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. He was being tortured and tormented immediately. Like, he died, and that's where he was. And that's what happens today. Can still, anyone who dies, if you're not saved, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to lift up your eyes, and you're going to be in hell already. That's where you'll be. And if you're saved, you know, the angels will take you to heaven. And that's exactly what happens. It's not soul sleep. You're not just, just sitting in the ground and, and unconscious and not aware of anything that's going on around you. But here in 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse number 6. The Bible says right here, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So he's saying, look, while we're in this physical body, while I'm walking around the earth, we're absent, we're away from God, because God's in heaven, right? He says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse number 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So once we're absent from this body, if you're saved, when, you're, when, when you leave this body, you go and you're going to be with the Lord. And, and it's that simple. And, and the Bible defines death as in James chapter 2. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a memory. I do. I can't. It's escaping me right now. I'll turn it real quick. When the Bible talks about faith without works being dead. The Bible says in James 2.26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Your body, defined by the Bible, your body is dead when your spirit departs from the body. That's what death is. I know um, medically, um, death is defined a little bit different. For us today, it's like you know, your heart's not beating or maybe there's no brain activity or something like that. The Bible defines physical death as the spirit being gone from your body. So at that moment, that's when you're considered dead. And that is what, what happens at death, is your spirit is removed from your body. So there is this, this concept of people's soul just, just staying in their body at death doesn't line up with the Bible at all. It's a false doctrine um, that's taught, but it's just it, it holds no water in light of the scripture. So it's, it's real simple to explain why he's talking about sleep. He's not really dead um, spiritually. He's just, his, his body is physically died. So that's what Jesus says. There. He says, okay, well, Lazarus is dead, you know, but, I, but he had said, I'm going to go to awake him because he knows what he's going to do. He's going to revive him from the dead. He says in verse 15, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And see, Jesus did this on purpose. He waited for two days on purpose. Jesus didn't go... And because if he would have gone earlier, you see, when he finally ends up getting there, it's been four days already since he's been dead. He doesn't want to detract from this miracle at all. He knows that if he would have gone right away, maybe he would have been dead, but maybe he would have only been dead by a few hours, right? And then if he were to, to bring him back to life, you know, people could look at that and be like, well, no, he just, well, he must not have really been dead. Or, you know, he's just like a really good doctor or something that's able to do that. Because, I mean, even today, right, we have, we have EMTs, you have medical staff that, that people can, their heart can stop beating and stop the brain activity. But then you give them CPR and you pump them and resuscitate them. And you can bring people literally back to life in, in our definition of, of death and life. And um, it is an amazing thing, but it's not necessarily uncommon. So what Jesus is saying here, he's like, no, I've waited. I'm glad for your sakes. Because he's glad for everyone's sake that's going to witness this miracle. Because he's doing it for them that they can see and that they can understand that God has sent him. That he is the messenger. That he is the Christ. It's, it's a proof that he's giving to them that he is Jesus Christ. And um, by, by performing this miracle, raising somebody back from the dead. 
So the fact that he's gone four days, and we'll see in a little bit, you know, that his sister even says, you know, Lord, he stinketh. You know, after four days of being dead in this tomb, the body's going to start decaying. He's gonna, and it's going to stink. So they're saying, don't, you know, don't open up the grave because it's not going to be that good. And, um, but after four days, you know, that's a long time. There is no, no explanation for that. You can't just explain that away. It has to be a miracle. You can't just say, oh, well, yeah, he really wasn't dead or something like that. Or, you know, he woke up. No. He was, he literally was dead and it was for four days to give that, um, the power to this miracle. Now let's, let's, um, keep reading. So in verse number 16, it says, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now, the way this is worded, I can see how this might be a little bit confusing, because he says this right after Jesus is talking about Lazarus being dead. So when he says, let us go that we may die with him, he's not talking about that we may die with Lazarus, because that really wouldn't make any sense. If he said, let us go that we may die with him, and he's talking about Lazarus, that they may die with Lazarus, no. No. The reason why Thomas said that, his disciples, his disciple, is because um, if you look up to verse number 8, it says, His disciples said, And master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. It's because they knew that people were trying to put Jesus Christ to death. And that's why they were warning him, because when he said, Hey, let's go up to Judea, he's like, they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, people want to kill you there. Are you sure you want to go up to Judea? So when Jesus says he's going to go to wake Lazarus and all this other stuff, then Thomas is like, well, hey, let's go with Jesus that we may die with him, talking about Jesus Christ, that, that they can be with Jesus. Hey, if they're going to kill Jesus, let us go also and let us be with him, and they can kill us too. This is what Thomas is saying. That makes a lot more sense than, than him talking about let us go to die with Lazarus, because that wouldn't make any sense. Um, but I just want to clear up. Maybe you didn't have that, that issue, but I know one of the first times I read the Bible that kind of didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because your, your mind is just thinking about Lazarus being dead and then you see Thomas make that statement. But um, that's what he's referring to there is just the fact that the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. Uh, verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. So Martha's full of faith here. Um, she goes out to meet Jesus when she just hears that he's coming. And says, look, I know that if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. So she has a lot of faith here. She, I think she even believes that, that God can, can bring him, or that Jesus can bring him back to life at this point. But let's keep reading here. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want to get this, this passage in context. Um, verse 23, Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And again, a great the book of John, if you're, if you're looking to give the gospel to anybody, look through the book of John and, and pick out verses from here. There's so much great, um, so many great verses, so many great things that Jesus Christ said that are just very clearly stating that once you're saved, you are saved forever. You have eternal life. And that's what he says here. Jesus says, look, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ is life. Jesus Christ is that resurrection. He says, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe us. So Jesus Christ, out of his own mouth, he says, look, anybody who's alive right now, if you live and you believe in me, he says, you're never going to die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that? And this is, that's an important question for you to ask yourself. 
to know whether or not you're saved. Do you believe that if you believe on Jesus Christ, you're never going to die? Now, physically, obviously, we're all going to pass away. This body is going to part from us, but that's not the death that he's referring to. It's our soul. It's our spirit. Once our spirit has eternal life, he says, look, you're never going to die. You have eternal life. It's everlasting. You can never lose that. It's forever. Great, great verses here. And she saith unto him, so look at her answer. He asks if she believes in him, and um, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She says, yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God which should come into the world. So her answer is basically, of course I believe that, um, excuse me, that anyone who believes in you shall never die because you are the Christ. Because I believe that you are the Christ that's come into the world, who was prophesied in the Old Testament throughout all the old scriptures, all the way back through, you know, Moses spake of him, all the prophets spake of him. So she knew, she's like, well, yeah, I believe you're the Christ. So, of course, you're the Savior of the world. I believe that. And, and anyone who puts their faith in the Savior is saved and shall never die. Verse 28 says, And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into, ta into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, I'm going to stop here, because this, this section of, of Scripture I want to kind of spend a little bit of time on. We see a little bit of a difference here between Martha and Mary. And they were sisters. Now, Martha heard that Jesus was coming. And the Bible says that Martha went out to meet him, but Mary stayed behind. Mary stayed there. Um, Mary waited until she was called. See, Martha came back to Mary and said, look, the Lord calls you. you know, she, and, and then, but when she heard that, what'd she do? She arose and went up quickly, it says, and she didn't delay, and she went out to see him. As soon as she found out, hey, you know, Jesus wants to see you, boom, she's up, she goes, and she goes to meet him. She, does, she doesn't stay around. Now, we need to kind of get ourselves in this story a little bit. Their brother just died. He's been dead for a few days. And they're grieving. Obviously, they're really sad. They're really distraught. And it's very possible, and it happens all the time, when people get in situations of extreme grief, when, when something goes really bad, especially with loss of life, that people can tend to get bitter towards God. And it's not a good reaction to get. It's a poor reaction. It's not the right thing to do. But people will get angry, get mad. They'll get bitter against God and say, God, why did you allow this to happen? And they'll start to put the blame on God. Now, it would have been very easy for them to have this type of an attitude. And you kind of see it coming out because both of them said, you know, Mary came and she's like, look, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. If you would have just been here, he wouldn't have died. You can see they're upset. Now, now, praise the Lord, Mary didn't just have this bad attitude where she just went away from Jesus and she didn't go to see him. Because too many people do that. They'll just end up turning their back. They'll, they'll have a, you know, maybe, a, maybe they'll lose a child or maybe some, you know, some tragedy happens in their life, and then they just turn against God. And God will be calling them, but they won't come. Because they're bitter, because they blame God for what happened. It's not right to blame God for what happened. We see here, there was a plan all along, from the beginning. Martha didn't understand that. Mary didn't understand that. Nobody else understood that, but Jesus knew. God knew what that plan was. Even in tragedy, even in these worst things that could happen, you could say, I don't understand how anything good could come out of this. We can't blame God for things that happen. And you know, in this case, you know, he died of a sickness, and, and they could blame him and say, well, look, if you would have been here, you could have healed him because you have the power to heal people. But um, other times things happen you know, as a result of someone else's sin. It's not God's fault. You know, it's not God's fault that Lazarus died. And just as much as it's not God's fault if someone 
breaks into your house and, and murders you with you know in cold blood. It's not his fault. That's the person's fault who went and did that. God gave us free will. Now, what people do is say, well, yeah, but God's able to protect us, and, and, and he is. And say, well, because God didn't do this, then I'm going to blame God. Well, no, it's still not his fault. If God doesn't intercede and step in, it doesn't make it his fault for the evil actions that people do. There are still consequences for, for people's actions, and there's still, um, you know, people can inflict harm and do bad things against others. We can't get mad at God. It's not his fault. But um, at the same time, you know, it's important to understand that God is able to do these things. We know as Martha had more faith. She was able to go, she went to, Mary, to, to Jesus right away. And she said, she said, look, I know if you would have been here, you wouldn't have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, he'll do it for you. So that's why she went to him first. Mary stayed behind. She was still kind of more focused on, you know, man, I, you know, just really sad and upset. Why didn't Jesus come? If he would have just been here, he could have, he could have saved my brother. And she was just really upset. Martha was still upset. They, were, they both loved their brother very much. But Martha still went to Jesus more in hope than in, and Mary went to him more in grief. But notice, too, though, that they both went to Jesus. They didn't leave him. They didn't forsake him. And when bad things happen in your life, one of the worst things you can do is, one, blame God for it. It's not his fault. But number two is then to just, to just let that get you away from God and let that get you away from Jesus. You don't want to get away from him. He's, he loves you. He's someone, you know, look, think about, think about how foolish this would be. We already saw from the Bible, Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus loved Mary. Jesus loved Martha. For them to then get angry and say, well, it's your fault that Lazarus died, and then to, to have nothing to do with them would have been foolish. The Son of God loves you. He's got a plan. Just trust him and, and keep praying to him and ask him. I mean, Mary or Martha was even saying, look, even now I know that whatever you ask God, he'll do it for you. And um, that's the type of faith. We need to have this faith like, like Martha had even in our worst times, to still go to Jesus. And that's the time when you need him the most anyways. When bad things happen to you, you need God more than ever. The worst thing to do is to turn around and go away from him. But, we, and then we see here, I mentioned this already before, that um, she still seeks him out, and she still goes back to him, even, even Mary does, when she finds out, hey, the Lord calls you, she says she went quickly. She dropped what she was doing and said, okay. And that's the way that we ought to answer God's calls in our life too. Whatever that may be. God wants you to do something. God wants you to get right with him. God wants you to live a certain way. Hey, let's not delay. Let's just rise up quickly and go to him. Let's just rise up quickly and get on that path that's, that's headed towards Jesus and, and, and start doing what we're supposed to be doing right away. Don't put it off. Don't, don't delay in that. But let's keep reading here. The Bible says, um, so we finish in verse 32, where Mary comes and she falls down on his feet and, and says that uh, if you'd been here, you know, my brother had not died. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Now, verse 35, that's the, the shortest verse in the entire Bible. It's just two words. Jesus wept. But what a powerful verse that is. Uh, again, um, we're, we're seeing in the book of John a lot of the, the human side of Jesus Christ as well. I mean, of course we're seeing the deity of Christ, that he's God in the flesh. But at the same time, we're seeing these attributes of him. He cared for people. He loved them. He wept for people. He was sad, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And it's going to be a great, a great miracle. And people will be rejoicing for that. He still had compassion and still felt the empathy for everyone else. That, you know, he was, he was groaning in the spirit. And, and anyone who's been around people who are in, you know, real, a, a lot of grief and you love those people... You feel for them. You grieve in your heart for them. And it really stirs you and it moves you to see people going through 
that type of emotional troubles and struggles. And Jesus really felt for them, and, and he wept because he loved them. He wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead, because he knew he was going to raise him back again from the, from the grave. He was weeping because of all the grief and, and sorrow that everybody else had, and he, and, and he felt bad for them. And it was, he was groaning in his spirit. Then it says in verse 36, Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone, stone lay upon it. So he groans again after they say that because he, he's in this situation. It's a really emotional time because he was their hope. Remember, Jesus was the... Like, they really just wanted to get Jesus there. People had seen the miracles. Even the Jews were saying, look, this man, he opened up the eyes of the blind. We already read that story. The guy that was blind from his birth. Jesus gave him his sight back. They're saying, well, look, if he could do these miracles, don't you think that this guy also couldn't have, couldn't have healed Lazarus so that, that he wouldn't have died? And um, it's real moving. He's at, the, he's at the center of this. He's at the center of, of their attention of... of um, you know, coming just a little bit too late. And, and there's this grief and this sadness. So um, he, was, he was moved by this. But look what he does. Verse 39 says, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Now, I think it's important to note that he's been dead four days. Um, also, not just to give him the, the credibility of that miracle, but it was four days instead of just waiting three days to not be confused at all with any prophecies of his own resurrection from the dead. That it, it was an extra day than, than Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So the prophecy of Jesus Christ coming back after three days, there's no way you can, you can apply this to Lazarus because it was four days. It, would, it does not match up at all with prophecy of Jesus being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And, of course, Jesus' resurrection was different, too, because Jesus, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, when he came back to life, he came back in his glorified body. He came back. He's the first begotten of the dead. That's what the Bible says, talking about the resurrection, Christ the first fruits, then they that are Christ that is coming, and then come at the end. So there's three resurrections. There's Christ the first fruits. Then there's going to be a resurrection at the rapture. That's when we get our new bodies. <laughs> That's when we're caught up together with Christ in the air. And then, at the very end, at the last, last day, there's going to be a resurrection of everybody else. And that's, that's when the, the, the great white throne judgment and uh, those that, are, that were in hell are going to be lifted out of hell. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. And um, those are the resurrections. But, um, and that was Christ's resurrection was different than Lazarus. See, Lazarus' resurrection was just a physical one. He came back in his same body, and Lazarus ended up dying again. Unlike Jesus Christ, who he was dead, but he's alive forevermore. He never, you know, he, he can, he's continuing on forever. And the fact that Jesus was dead means that he did actually go to hell. Now, um, Lazarus isn't the first person either in the Bible to have been brought back to life after physically dying. You remember um, Elisha also did the same thing. With the, with the woman's son that died, um, the woman that, that made a little place for him in the house as he was traveling, he could stay there, so he wanted to show her kindness, so, so you know, he prayed to God that God would give her a son, and then that son died, he was still kind of young, and he went and recovered that child from death, and then also, after when Elisha was buried, they threw a man into that grave, and that man came back to life. So there's, there's been a couple other times where people have actually, have actually been brought back to life, but not very many, very, very, very few times. And not in this way either, the way that Jesus you know, brought back Lazarus from the dead after four days. This is, this is a, a very big event. This is like the, the grand finale of the miracles that Jesus did. Not that he ceased to do miracles, but this is like, this is the culmination of his ministry in, in this event with Lazarus. This has a profound effect on, on a lot of people because this was a, a lot of people heard about this. And we find out later that people 
are coming not even just to see Jesus, but they want to see Lazarus. They heard about this guy that was that was brought back from the dead after four days. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't you like to talk to that guy? If you knew someone that was dead for four days and put in a grave and he came back to life, like, just to just to talk to him, be like, man, what happened? Like, what, what was it like for those four days? Or, you know, just to see him and, like, like touch him, be like, man, were you really dead? And and it just causes a great stir. And that's what a lot of people did with Lazarus. Um way more so than even someone who was blind and they received their sight. I mean, that gathers attention as well. All these miracles that Jesus did, but someone coming back from the dead, Jesus raising him from the dead after four days is a huge miracle. A lot of people hear about this, and um, we're going to get into that real briefly here with how the Jews just can't handle that, that he did that. Um, so where did we leave off? Okay, so he says, Take you away the stone. Martha said, uh, verse 39, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So we see here... You know, Jesus basically just thanks God. They open up the, the grave, and he already knows that Lazarus is alive. And that, that he's raised back from the dead. And he thanks God out loud in front of everybody. And just says, God, I thank you that you heard me. And he says, I know that you always hear me. So the reason why I'm thanking you out loud now, it's not because I don't, you know, because I'm surprised that you actually heard me. I know you always heard me, but I said it so that everyone else here can hear and understand that you sent me, that I am here in your name, and that there is no disputing this, that this is coming from the Lord. And verse 43, it says, And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So he's standing in front of that cave, that grave where they let him, and he screams out and calls out to Lazarus and says, Come on out. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his faith was, face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said, let him loose him, let him go. So imagine this sight. You know, they, they, um, I don't know the details on the, uh, the, the burial process that, that the Jews did back in these days. But it says he was bound hand and foot. Cause I, well, so how I picture is like, you know, you wrap someone up so they look kind of like a mummy. Right? Which it sounds kind of like that's what they did. And, they, and they, put, they tied some kind of a napkin over his face. So he's got to be coming out, you know, like this. And, and um, Jesus says, okay, you know, loose him, let him, let him go so he can walk freely. But what a sight would that be? Imagine being in front of that grave, and, and I mean, you don't know what to expect. This guy's been dead for four days, everybody's grieving, and all of a sudden, here comes Lazarus walking out of that tomb. And they, they cut off those, those grave clothes, and, and, um, and it's amazing. It says, verse 45, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. So now we see... Many of the Jews. Um, previously, you know, some of the Jews have been believing. There's always been those that would believe. There's, there's some of the rulers and chief priests even believed. But they did it secretly. They didn't, they didn't really want to make it known. But when this miracle happened, it says many of the Jews believed. So this, because this, this is a big event. I mean, you, people can try to justify things in their mind. You see someone get healed. You could try to say, oh, you know, come up with, with, you want to deceive yourself somehow on how certain things can happen and say, well, it's just a trick. Oh, that guy wasn't really blind or whatever. Whatever you might want to come up with. But the people who saw this miracle, there's no mistake in it. The guy was dead for four days. There's, there's no bluffing that. There's no, you know, no faking that. The grieving and everything else, they weren't acting. They knew they were in this experience. They knew what happened. And when they see him come back from the dead, that is just unmistakable. You cannot say that that's the power of Satan. You can't say anything against that. God has the power to raise the dead. Satan does not. And, and, and everybody knows this. You cannot put this off on anything else than just to say that this is the power of God. And that's what the Bible says, you know, that many believed on him there. But some of them, it says, but some of them went their ways. Now, not everybody believed. It says many, but it doesn't say all. Imagine that. Imagine the, what kind of a heart you'd have to have to see something like that still after everything else that Jesus has been doing, 
everything he's been preaching, everything he's been teaching, see the dead brought back to life and still not believe that it's from God. That's, that's a cold, hardened heart that doesn't believe. So these guys go and they kind of tell them, they go and tell the Pharisees, they say, man, you know, they told them what things Jesus had done in verse 47. It says, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we for this man doeth many miracles. They're not disputing the fact that he's doing miracles. Again, now these, these are the wicked, evil people that killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They know that he's doing miracles. They're not disputing that. They're not denying that. They're just saying, okay, what are we going to do about this guy? This guy is doing miracles. We can't deny it. So what are we going to do? It says, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. We see what they care about. What they care about. They cared about their position. They cared about their power. They cared about being in that political ruling or whatever that they had. They were worried, oh man, if this guy gets too much attention, the Romans are just going to come and they're going to take away our place and they're going to take away our nation. They're worried about their, their physical domain. And um, instead of just accepting that this is God in the flesh, this is the, this is the Christ who's come to deliver our people, and they just want to keep from now. Now, as I said, we've gone over this topic in the past already about people who are reprobate, people who are rejected of God, people who are false prophets, people who are inwardly wolves. Maybe outside they look like a sheep. Right? They look like these religious leaders that they're so holy and, they, and that they're following God, but inwardly they're wolves. They're out to destroy. And it's not a mistake that it says, verse 48, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Their goal is to get people not to believe on Christ. They have a wicked goal of, of preventing people from getting saved from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is no different today. There are lots of wolves out there in sheep's clothing today that are trying to prevent people from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we have all these different religions, which is why we have all this confusion, which is why we have this falsely called science in our godless schools being taught to our children saying that you came from a monkey. That's why it's there. It's because they want to do whatever they can to prevent people from just believing on the Lord, from believing on Jesus Christ and that they can be saved. So they're going to come up with any way possible to prevent that from happening. And they have to have a council about it. I mean, they're, they're getting together. They're conspiring about this. What are we going to do? We cannot have people believing on Jesus Christ. That is wicked. That is extremely wicked. Um, and these people exist today. It wasn't just these men at this time. This has been going on throughout history. And we have to realize this and wake up to this, that there are really bad people out there. Even And, and again, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. It's, it's hard for normal people to imagine, imagine the mindset of somebody who's wicked like this, who will get together and who will conspire to do evil and to do harm and to prevent people from believing on Christ. It's hard to imagine that, that, that people would actually spend their time coming up and conspiring with ideas to do wickedness and to do evil in the people, but they're out there. It's reality. And, and you could try to, to live in a bubble and say, no, generally people aren't that bad. And maybe generally that's true. A normal person doesn't. But people who are rejected, people who are reprobate, these false prophets, they're not your, your average person. They're out to destroy. And, and, and they're going to come at you looking like they're, they're a good guy. And they're not. And we just need to be aware of this. These people gathered a council, and, they, and they're trying to figure out what to do with Jesus Christ, how they're going to kill him, because that's their only option. They can't shut him up. They can't stop him. They've already tried to get people to, to catch him in his words, and to try to trick him, and to try to, try to deceive him, and, and try to do all these things, and it's always failed. The wisdom of God is, is so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a vain effort for them to even try to, to attempt to do so, to try to, to, to battle against God. And, and, and try to catch him in his words. Jesus was wiser than all of them, and it didn't work. Nothing that they did was going to work, so the only option they have left now is just to destroy him. They say, well, we have to shut him up, and we're just going to kill him, um, because nothing else is going to work against him. But let's just keep reading. We'll finish off this chapter. It says, um, 
Verse 49, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. This is really interesting and important to note here too, that the high priest, see God at this time was using Israel to, um, and he's using the Jews, he's using Israel to, to deliver his word unto us. So because this Caiaphas was as was a high priest, it says he spake this and it's a prophecy. He actually gave this prophecy not of himself. It's not something he came up with on his own. He actually spake the word of God here, even though he was a wicked man and not saved. And it's important to just, to just understand that, that people can be used of God, for God to bring about God's will, even if, even if they're not saved. Like oftentimes you remember when God brings judgment against somebody, he'll use an army from another nation that's extremely wicked to bring judgment upon his own people. And what they're doing, whether they know it or not, like Caiaphas didn't even know it, it wasn't even of himself, whether they know it or not, they're, do, they're, they're executing God's will. They're doing what God had planned and what he wanted. Now, what I think is really interesting about the statement that he said, the Bible tells us clearly that he didn't speak this of himself. It's not something that he came up with on his own. But I would imagine that the people that heard this are probably thinking something different than it meant. Now, this prophecy, let's look at it again real quick. It says, um, he says at the end of verse 49, you know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. He's talking about Jesus Christ, right, dying on the cross for the sins of the whole nation, the sins of everybody. That's what he's prophesying here. But what the people there were probably thinking, because what were they worried about? They were worried about the Romans coming in, that they would lose their nation. So what, what they're probably thinking is like, well, yeah, we need to put Jesus to death so that we don't lose our nation. It's expedient for this man to die for us to get our personal gain. That's how they're interpreting it, and that's what they're thinking of it as, but that's not what the prophecy is really about. The prophecy is really about Jesus Christ coming to die for the sins of the whole world and, um, and, and to pay for the sins. And, and the reason why he was even used is because he was the high priest that year to, um, to deliver that, that prophecy. Uh, we're almost able to just finish reading up here. It says... In verse 52, and not for that nation only, but also, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. So from this day, now they're serious about just killing Jesus Christ. After they take counsel, what are we going to do? We just need to kill him. We need to stop people from believing on him, and the only way we can do this is by killing him. Of course, that backfires on him too, because it's all part of God's plan. They could do nothing unless it, the power is given unto them by God to even, to even execute that plan. And, um, you know, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus Christ, it was all part of the plan. They killed him, they were wicked, but he knew it was for a greater purpose. And when he rose again from the dead, praise the Lord, hey, they, that, that did more against them than anything else could have. By him being killed and, and being resurrected after three days, gave him that much more power, even than the power of people seeing Lazarus coming back from the dead. And it's evidence today, I mean, we still follow Christ 2,000 years later, and so many people have throughout time. Um, there's no way you can, you can fight against God or stop God when, when he wants something to be done. And um, they thought they could do it, but they couldn't. Verse 54 says, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. So he knew that they were trying to kill him, which is why now he's starting to lay low, because he's got to do it at the right time. He's waiting for his time to come. So he's going to lay low. He's okay. 
I can't walk openly, because if he walked openly, they're going to just arrest him and kill him. In verse 55, we get that here. It says, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he would show it that they might take him. So now they, they, they make a decree and they're saying, look, like he's wanted, right? They're putting up wanted signs of Jesus. They're saying, if you know where he is, you need to tell us because he, we're going to arrest him. We're going to take him and they're going to kill him. And that's why Jesus is kind of laying low because his time is not quite come yet. And he's, and that's why even before that, we already saw that they were, they were seeking to slay him. You know, the, his disciples were saying, why are you going back to Judea? You know, you know that they're trying to kill you there. But now they, did, they make this decree, and, and they're serious about it, and they're not hiding it at all. Everybody knows that they're trying to, they're trying to get Jesus Christ here. But um, anyway, so this, you know, this whole chapter covers basically this great miracle of Lazarus being risen again, being resurrected from the dead. Great miracle. And, and again, he did that. Jesus said he did that to prove that he was the Christ, that God sent him. Jesus gave all of the proofs necessary when he walked on this life for those that want to, to, to know for sure that this Jesus was from God, that he wasn't just some wacko. You know, people try to claim that, that you know, oh, Jesus was a lunatic. And, you know, you hear this from atheists, people trying to say, well, what do we do with people today who claim that they're God and claim that they're from God? We lock them away in a sane asylum. Yeah, it's a cute thing to say. And, and it's something that's, that's meant to just, to just be disparaging against your faith. But these people who claim to be God these days, these antichrists, they're not walking around and healing the sick. They're not raising people from the dead. They're not walking on water. That's why I always say to the atheists and say, oh yeah, you, you know, basically he's trying to say you believe in some, you know, in some nutcase, in some, in some lunatic. Because, because he claimed to be God. And say, okay, well, yeah, if he was walking around today and he was healing people, he was raising from the dead, he was healing people who are blind, just by saying a word, you're going to call that, all of a sudden you're going to put him in the same category as people who, who, are, who are bums and are drunks and druggies and, and are claiming to be God? I don't think so. Not even close to the same thing. Jesus did these things, and they're recorded, and they're, they're evidence that's proof to show he was from God. The words that he spake are true. He was the Christ. He is the Christ. And just remember that verse that said, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Our life is in Jesus Christ. If you're alive today and you haven't put your faith in him, believe on him with all your heart and you shall never die. According to the Bible, let's borrow us a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this great miracle of, of Lazarus being raised again from the dead. God, we thank you for showing us openly that, that your love for people and that you, the emotions that you've had um, and you understand what it's like to grieve. Lord, I pray that if tragedy ever strikes anyone that's here today, that, that you would help us to run to you, dear Lord, and not to run away from you. That, that we wouldn't turn our backs on you, but that we would, um, we would come to you and just know that that all things are possible with you and that you would just comfort us and, and provide us the, the comfort that we need in our time of, of loss or mourning or great grief. God, help us not to, not to be deceived into thinking, into blaming you and speaking foolishly, dear Lord, but to, to um, just to understand that we may not understand all the things that happen in our life, but that we're going to continue to trust in you either way, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.